group. NTI, she said, was reevaluating its elite strategy to deal with this question and moving toward recognizing that we need a change of culture. And she suggested that the Catholic Church should have a parish-oriented strategy to get ordinary Catholics more engaged in these issues and understanding just how serious a problem we have. Um, so this panel is going to explore some of that. How do you how do you inform consciences? A continuation of what I think what Drew Christensen uh, just did. But, and how do you do education? How do you, beyond you know, the Washington elites or the London elites, the, the Geneva elites who normally deal with this question? Um, so today we have our facilitator, Kevin Ahern, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College. We have Professor Margaret File, who holds a joint appointment in the Department of Theology and the Center for Social Concerns at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and we have Aaron Connolly, who is a master's student in peace studies at the Kroc Institute at Notre Dame and is associate program director for a, a new NGO she helped start called Girl Security and also a research analyst at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. So uh, take it away. Great. Hello, I'm Erin. Um, I'll try and be brief, it's the end of the day. And first, I just wanted to thank the conference organizers and everyone for being here and staying till the end. Uh, so as other panels have illustrated today, nuclear disarmament progress has been stagnating for quite some time, and we're approaching regression. US leadership to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons seems to have fallen to the wayside, and instead, Trump's erraticism has forced us into damage control mode, where we're studying how Twitter impacts escalation dynamics and how to salvage what was regarded as a landmark multilateral agreement with Iran just a few years ago. The nuclear proliferation space is a tough place to be these days, and I'm saying that as someone who hasn't been here very long. As policymakers and activists, we are acutely aware of the existential threat posed by nuclear weapons and the incredible amount of physical, physical and environmental destruction, long-term radiation effects, and indiscriminate suffering is disturbing to say the least, and as wonks, we talk to policymakers on Capitol Hill, activists and everyday citizens about these issues and their importance. When we do so, it seems many are aware of the threat, but unwilling or uninterested in taking action, or just simply unaware of their own agency when it comes to a topic as intractable as nuclear weapons. So while policymakers in DC hold the legal power over US nuclear weapons policy, they're held accountable through their constituents. Members of Congress generally want to get reelected, and because being strong on defense has become such a serious voting issue, it's often cited as a reason not to engage in nuclear force reduction. But what if we flipped that? Only a generation ago, nuclear disarmament was a voting issue, and politicians who didn't support it faced a tough re-election campaign. However, the lack of public awareness in recent years has led to virtually a blank check for nuclear policy, and the gap between the public and policy has deepened over the years, but it's not insurmountable. In 2018, my colleague Kate and I uh, set out to start the long process of closing this gap. We were new to the field and eager to share our passion, wondering how we had stumbled into an existential issue, one that we felt probably should have come up once or twice in our education before we arrived in DC. <laughs> so we looked to the next generation, and Gen Z has already proven their investment and engagement with existential risk through climate change, as been talked about here today. And through public education, we can make nuclear policy a pillar of this risk conversation moving forward. But this requires conscience raising that transcends generations and maintains nuclear accountability through time. So through our project, when we started to start, we decided to start with Gen Z, and we met students where they were. So we went to the classroom. And we wanted to target a Manhattan Project site and chose Richland, Washington. Kate grew up there, and we saw a community built on nuclear weapons technology, and one with the second most offensive mascot in America, it is a mushroom cloud, would have a stronger foundation of nuclear history, but we were wrong. Before the presentation began, we gave out a brief survey, just nine questions, the basics of who has nuclear weapons, how many nuclear weapons, who has suffered a nuclear attack, and through this, we found 24 different countries were listed as having suffered a nuclear attack. 36 different countries were listed as having nuclear weapons, including Africa. And in terms of numbers, students put anywhere from zero to a million nuclear weapons in the world. But one of the most common answers was too many, and we can work with that. 
Our Nuclear Reference 101 provided the basics of nuclear weapons history and policy in plain English with no bias. Kate and I didn't agree on everything, so that really grounded the presentation on the facts. And we wanted to empower students with information and allow them to make their own conclusions. We found students to be incredibly engaged and concerned that no one had really talked to them about this before. And honestly, students ask the hardest questions. As part of my job with the Center for Arms Control, we focused on educating members of Congress and their staff on nuclear weapons policy, yet high school students are often the ones to actually stump me uh, because they don't share our basic assumptions and they approach nuclear weapons policy in an incredibly different way and they're often more interested in cooperation instead of domination. And one student asked us why no one sanctioned the United States for developing a nuclear weapon when we seemed, seemed to sanction everyone else for doing the same. We were consistently asked about a shield or missile defense, and if the shield was us shooting incoming nuclear weapons with our own nuclear weapons, or if it was some sort of force field, and why didn't we just nuke North Korea once and for all? We worked through each of these questions, challenging students' perception, and even our own, of what US nuclear policy is and what it should be. We found the next generation eagerly asking questions and actively participating while looking for our next step. The next step is key. Awareness and education are important, but tying it to action is what's going to create change. As policymakers and activists, we must consider how it is we can involve students, teachers, and the general public in this traditionally exclusive debate. What can others do to use their voice on this topic? Because not everyone's going to commit their whole life's work to it. While seemingly mundane, letters and calls for representatives can make a difference, but we should also think bigger. We need to create a pipeline and a path to action for the public, and this can be done in several ways. First, we need to connect nuclear weapons, the nuclear weapons issue to personal definitions of security. Girl security, where I work, works to empower girls to participate in the national security debate and redefine it for themselves. Women represent over half the population, but constitute about one third of ex experts featured on panels on foreign policy. And our programs happen in and outside the classroom, providing girls with frameworks to approach national security. Girls and women understand security and vulnerability on a personal level from a very young age. By tying abstract policy to personal security issues and focusing on the resilience of women that they exhibit often in everyday life, students very quickly grasp how personal security connects to their community and, lar and more largely national security. Girls are aware of the threats around them, voicing concerns that if they register to vote, they'll be hacked by Russia, that if a nuclear weapon goes off, what do we actually do? And what can they do to prevent a nuclear weapon from going off? There's already a level of public awareness of national security and nuclear threats. There's just no empowerment to action. And secondly, we need to connect nuclear weapons issues to other issues that young people care about and are already acting upon. This isn't a new novel idea, but a recent report focusing on millennials in war by the International Committee on the Red Cross found that 54% of millennials believe a nuclear attack is likely to happen within the next decade which makes sense given the fire and fury, the skirmishes between India and Pakistan, and the unstable relationship with Iran. But somehow, with this massive concern looming, nuclear weapons ranked as the least concerning issue among the 12 issues presented to millennials. Corruption, unemployment, and increasing poverty topped the list. On all across the globe, but especially here in the US, young people are increasingly taking to the street to march and vote in favor of transformational action. And they're doing this on things like climate change, gun violence, social justice, anti-corruption. And it may not seem immediately obvious, but nuclear weapons touch and in fact exacerbate all of these issues. So this is how you motivate young people to know and care about nukes, by educating them about the ways in which they touch the issues they already care about and when there's already action. Education is a critical part of this conscious formation, and we must meet students in the public where they are and connect to issues they already know and understand. Girls and women are acutely aware of evolving security threats, and their awareness should be tied to action. Passion and drive for important policies of climate change and gun control can also cultivate widespread nuclear action. As the recent report demonstrates, awareness is not enough. Nuclear weapons are on the public radar, but still appear out of reach. We must move beyond awareness and towards empowerment in order to cultivate accountability and change. And students deserve to be treated for what they are, agents of change. And if we do that, we might just move beyond deterrence. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's a delight to be here. And, and thank you, Drew, for organizing this, and um, Ruth and Anna. Uh, for all of your work on this as well. 
And thank you, Erin, for what you just said. Um, one of my most formative experiences with, was with Joan Kroc in San Diego when I was transitioning from high school into college at Notre Dame, uh, where she had just uh, funded the Kroc Institute there um, in collaboration with Father Hesburgh. She started a group in San Diego called Mothers Embracing Nuclear Disarmament. And we went to Balboa Park with our mothers um, to advocate. And uh, I feel like she's with us here today and would be happy to hear of your efforts, Erin. So uh, there is a handout going around. Um, uh, I, I've been asked to address formation of conscience, and um, I worked on a, a chapter as part of a, a volume that Drew is editing. Um, at the Vatican Conference in 2017, when Pope Francis issued his statement um, in which he condemned not only the threat of use of nuclear weapons, but also the possession, um, it raised a number of questions that I think we've been unpacking uh, in the last few sessions. Um, and I was uh, leaving that conference with others asking, well, what work is needed ethically and theologically to help form the consciences of US citizens regarding the possession and use of nuclear weapons? I think that people at that conference from other countries were, were much more optimistic um, than, than I felt leaving that and um, in conversation with other of my compatriots. Uh, we realize that it's a pretty daunting task um, for all of the reasons that we've heard today. So um, on the handout that I've given you, I, I uh, excerpted Gaudium et Spes 16, and I think we've already referred to this as a, a description of conscience. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you to read that. But the Catholic both and um, do good and avoid evil is right at the heart of what I hope to unpack today. And I've also given you a little description of conscience. I think R uh, Richard Gula's book, Reason Informed by Faith, is a good source to consult here. Um, and he says, conscience is another word like sin, often used but little understood. It involves the capacity to discern and choose the morally right course of action in a particular situation. And in doing so, a person brings to bear a lifelong process of formation of conscience. And each person has the obligation to form his or her conscience as fully and po uh, as possible and to follow it. Because the human person is social, conscience and the process of its formation are also socially situated. Adequate formation of conscience on a given issue will entail several steps, including seeking full and accurate information, consultation of trusted persons with expertise relevant to the situation, consideration of the church's teaching found in scripture and tradition, drawing upon the wisdom of personal and communal experience, and most importantly, prayerful discernment of the movement of the Holy Spirit as one seeks to apply guiding moral values in a particular situation. So as I anticipate making a, a certain choice, I'm invited to ask, who am I becoming as a person in relationship to God? Will this choice express the full freedom and authenticity of the person God created me to be as one made in God's image? Applying this general framework of formation of conscience to the nuclear context involves unpacking several categories of information for discernment. First, systemic considerations are especially relevant for the for formation of personal and social conscience in the case of nuclear weapons due to the particular circumstances governing their development and production. And secondly, the highly toxic nature of fissile material requires awareness of the real risks of nuclear waste and contamination, particularly in relation to the most vulnerable members of the biotic community. Thirdly, nuclear weapons pose a limit situation for humans' relationship with the rest of creation, drawing attention to the link between genocide and ecocide. So holding these three aspects of nuclear weapons together, I think it's possible to approach formation of personal and social conscience through specific questions for personal and communal discernment with the support of the ecclesial community. So the first, um, the first area I'd like to address with you, the systemic aspect of nuclear weapons. In her seminal work on secrecy, Cicela Bach notes that those working on the Manhattan Project some of the world's greatest scientists of the time 
were not informed about the scope and aim of their research, though they often guessed, she writes. They were asked to disguise the nature of their work in letters to friends and relatives or to talk in empty terms. When looking for a site for the project, townspeople were falsely told that the project had to do with the manufacture of electric missiles. Without feedback and debate concerning their undertaking and without day-to-day -day contact with the rest of the world, the scientists were an easy prey to complete absorption in their task and to denying or rationalizing away any doubts about their own, own role, unquote. Driven at least in part by the excitement and sense of power born of secrecy, they continued working on the project even after Germany's surrender in spring of 1945. By early 1944, what had proved a highly motivating object of desire for many scientists, that is, developing nuclear capability before Nazi Germany and keeping that technology out of Germany's control, had lost its power. Germany no longer posed a threat in that regard. For others, the real political aim of the race to build the atomic bomb was to attain leverage over the Soviets. In March of 1945, General Leslie Groves, director of the Manhattan Project, acknowledged as much in a casual dinner conversation among colleagues at Los Alamos. For Joseph Rotblat, a young Polish-born physicist present at the dining table that night, Groves' aside proved decisive in shaping his own opposition to the project. At a time when Germany could still have prevailed, quote, Russian soldiers were dying by the thousands in order to defeat the Germans, and Groves was speaking of them as if they were the enemy, more than the Germans, unquote. Thereafter, Rotblat re resigned from the Manhattan Project on moral grounds. Later in 1955, he would co-author a letter with Einstein and others to the general public opposing the nuclear arms race. Following Jacques Ellul, Daryl Fashing writes of Oppenheim Oppenheimer's assessment um, Oppenheimer gave a speech at Los Alamos in which he said, if you're a scientist, you can't stop such a thing. If you're a scientist, you believe that it is good to find out how the world works, that it's good to find out what the realities are, that it's good to turn over to humankind at large, the greatest possible power to control the world and to deal with it according to its lights and values, unquote. And Fashing writes of Oppenheimer's view, we call this the, the technical imperative. If it can be done, it must be done. So when one of the Manhattan si Project scientists, Leo Zillard, tried to get a letter of protest from the scientists to Chicago, in, in Chicago to President Truman, it was effectively subverted for security reasons. Technical experts were not supposed to raise ethical questions about math, mass death. They were supposed to follow orders with unquestioning obedience, unquote. For his part, Rothblatt did not find Oppenheimer's ac account persuasive, holding that the scientists did indeed bear moral responsibility for their participation in the project. The majority of scientists, he recalled, were not bothered by moral scruples. They were quite content to leave it to others to decide how their work would be used." Unquote. An individual is simply one small part of a hierarchical order of decision making and performs a discrete task directed toward a larger purpose that remain obscure to him or her in a project like that of the Manhattan Project. Uh, Fashing writes, such bureaucracies neutralize our capacity to be ethical by separating ends and means. Unlike my personal life where I choose both what I shall do, the ends, and how I shall accomplish it, the means, in a bureaucracy, those in authority higher up are believed to be in the best position to see the big picture and choose those ends. Those technical experts lower down in the hierarchy are simply expected to use their knowledge and skill to provide the means for carrying out ends chosen by others higher up with unquestioning obedience. Not having chosen the ends, one does not have to feel responsible for one's actions." Unquote. Urban Laszlo, a prominent systems philosopher, observes that when viewed systemically, groups take on a sort of personality of their own. So you can think about corporations or even baseball teams. The proper functioning of a system depends upon open channels of communication among the interactive parts, allowing the group or entity to make necessary adjustments in response to feedback. In social systems, theorist jo Joanna Macy emphasizes Individual members must make decisions for themselves as part of the integrity of the whole. 
in the case of the Manhattan Project, Rotblatt, along with Zillard, demonstrated that they, as individuals, stood in moral opposition to the direction of the group's efforts, and they acted accordingly, following their consciences. And here, I think what um, Bill Barbieri was saying earlier about moral ecology fits in very well within that larger systems view. How are people, subject, moral agents, subject of human dignity, um, uh, exercising their consciences? For the proper functioning of the system, uh, we need them to do that, right? And that's part of the larger uh, systemic well-being um, that moral ecology refers to. In this case, the dominant cultural milieu of the Manhattan Project greased the skids for those who did not want to take personal responsibility for their part in the whole effort. Rotblatt's own crystallization of conscience, that is the moment at that dinner table when he realized that what Leslie Groves was saying um, called him to accept moral responsibility. That's crystallization of conscience. Um, that depended upon receiving, almost by accident, key data about the real moral object of the work in which he participated. Measured by the narrow end of building atomic bombs, the means of secrecy served the Manhattan Project well. However, measured by the moral health of the social system and its members, withholding such relevant information as the true object of their common work complicated the ethical task for each person involved. So it's like walking through quicksand when you think about what it must have been like for those scientists to even ask the question, what is my responsibility here? Because the whole system and the momentum of that, of that system was encouraging them not only to, take re, to not take responsibility, but not even to ask those questions. That was seen as subversive. And in fact, Rotblatt was seen as a national security threat once he left the Manhattan Project. So this particular example highlights a formidable challenge in forming conscience with a view toward nuclear disarmament. In addition to the formation of personal conscience, members of society will need to attend to social conscience. How might communities and institutions support proper formation of conscience, not only for individuals, but also for the whole social group? For members of the military, scientific, and manufacturing communities responsible for the production, maintenance, and potential use of nuclear weapons, what ecclesial support might be necessary to help them resist the systemic pressures of the technical imperative and undertake the difficult task of forming their consciences as fully as possible? And maybe we could add to that list as we've been talking about un uh, Catholic universities and invested in uh, the production and maintenance uh, and manufacture of nuclear weapons. And for those more directly involved, indirectly involved in the nuclear weapons industry, but no less responsible for formation of conscience, how might the church encourage greater personal and communal awareness? In his 1961 farewell address, President Eisenhower, quote, warned against not only unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex, but the danger that public policy itself could become the captive of, of a scientific technological elite. That warning has largely been ignored, Stephanie Cook argues, allowing a huge secretive self-rationalizing system to take on a life of its own backed by history, money, power, and a default conviction in its own inevitability, unquote. In Solicitudere Socialis, uh, John Paul II talked about systems that seem to operate almost automatically, and uh, he used the language of structures of sin to describe that, um, borrowing from the Latin American bishops in doing that. Uh, I suggest to you that that language is very relevant here. Uh, what does it look like when we're, we're complicit in systems that seem to operate almost automatically, and yet we are moral agents? We are moral agents. So I think of taxpayers and investors who perhaps unwittingly continue to finance the research, development, as and assembly of nuclear weapons at tremendous socioeconomic and environmental cost. Um, we've already heard from Archbishop Tomasi about estimates of ongoing um, nuclear buildup that we're experiencing now. Um, the Arms Control Association estimated that over the next 30 years, the total cost of U.S. nuclear forces would be somewhere between 1.25 and 1.46 trillion in then year dollars. Through the expansive reach of transnational corporations, the nuclear weapons industry is spread throughout the U.S. and across the globe by design 
Every taxpayer likely and likely most workers with 401k investments are complicit in some way, but I think few of us have ever sorry, have ever actually consciously examined that or formed our consciences sufficiently to realize that fact. So I know we're um, conscious of time here, so moving on to the second point, uh, nuclear waste and contamination. I think another important facet of formation of conscience regarding the nuclear weapons industry is the reality of its highly toxic waste. And here, I say industry on purpose. I think we need to think not only about um, the production of weapons, but also so-called peaceful nuclear ends. Um, so Fukushima would be a prominent example um, of what is potentially at stake. For all the scientific and technological expertise required to develop nuclear weaponry, the waste disposal issue, once receiving attention, has proved an even more difficult challenge, involving prediction of the behavior of long-lived fission products and fissile materials for tens of thousands of years, which is longer than all of recorded history. Um, I'm being given a signal to start wrapping up. so. Um, in the post-Cold War era, the U.S. has found itself poorly equipped to deal with nuclear waste. Um, the National Academy of Sciences has determined that two-thirds of the government sites involved in nuclear weapons production will never be decontaminated. Um, and so they've actually used the language of national sacrifice zones in places like Oak, the Oak Ridge Complex in Tennessee and the Hanford Reservation in Washington. Um, they call them infinity rooms and seal them off. This metaphorical language of infinity rooms and national sacrifice zones belies the actual consequences of the headlong pursuit of nuclear power with very little thought given to the long-term ramifications for material creation. Um, the apocalyptic scenes described, described by Pedro Rupe and other survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki portended further sacrificial scapegoating. If it was possible to obliterate whole cities in the name of geopolitical strategy, not just Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also Tokyo, Dresden, and other population areas before them, it was not a large leap to rationalize the sacrifice of the rest of material creation. The Earth itself and all its inhabitants and ecosystems became a scapegoat for the pursuit of what was thought to be the ultimate power, now ostensibly under human control. So. Um, and I, I have more uh, regarding the effect on indigenous peoples. I think that uh, Marianne pointed to that um, poignantly, and I would want to echo what she said. Um, the last thing I, I would want to mention is um, the link between genocide and ecocide. Um, Jonathan Schell observed that the peril of human extinction in a nuclear holocaust is the middle term that links genocide and ecocide. The development of nuclear weapons took root in a trend toward the increasing destructive capacity of conventional weaponry and concomitant disregard for non-combatant life, as well as ideological rationalizations for the extermination of whole peoples and cultures. Turning a blind eye has also extended to the exponentially growing destructive effects of human activity on the natural environment. Nuclear weapons development prepared the way for a sort of inertial acceptance of mass extermination, not just of the human species, but also of the whole ecosphere. So Shell writes, in other words, nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy, which actually trade on genocide for political purposes called mutual assured destruction, threaten not just individual people in however large numbers, but the order of creation, natural and human, and this is something new, unquote. The very relational structures that bind together individual members of a wide variety of systems, familial, social, political, economic, cultural, and ecological, and provide them the context for their existence is at stake. Um, the magnitude of the prospect of ecocide means that formation of conscience regarding the possession and use of nuclear weapons must involve communal and ecclesial structures of support that encourage dialogical exploration of these manifold strands of interconnection. Woven into the very fabric of God's creation, reflecting the Trinitarian interrelationship of God's creation. And uh, it's something that Pope Francis emphasized clearly in Laudato Si. So on the handout that I gave you, um, 
you'll find there a potential guide for ongoing formation of conscience. I was thinking mainly about the parish level as I developed those questions. It's not at all exhaustive, it's a starting point, but in, as uh, Drew was mentioning, the, um, and I, I was talking last night with Carol, there's such a need at the parish level for this kind of work. Uh, uh, and so you have that before you, I don't need to walk through that, but we can certainly talk about it. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you for these two great papers. Uh, the field of peace studies, as many of us know, has helped to uh, unpack this notion of structural violence and structures of violence and in relation to positive and negative peace. Uh, and I think Margie's paper, uh, and which I, but I think it was uh, reflected in action with, uh, with Aaron's, uh, Aaron's paper here, uh, speaks about the power of systems and the power of communities. Right? And we have these systems or these structures of violence or maybe from a theological language, structures of sin uh, that are threatening the common good, threatening human dignity, and threatening life as we know it uh, on this particular issue. Uh, it seems to me though, if we look at successful social action movements over time, social structures, structures of violence have really only been able to be overcome by other sorts of organizing, other types of systems, other types of, you said ecclesial support, right? So I think a big challenge for us going forward is how do we mobilize, how do we capacity build, how do we support existing structures, uh, like the very, very, very good structures that are represented in this room, uh, Catholic Peace Building Initiative, uh, the, uh, the uh, Pax Christi, the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, uh, and other NGOs here, and then how do we talk to each other? So I think this space is a really important space, and I hope we can continue it, and, and thanks to Drew for this. Uh, if we look at the successful movements, earlier was mentioned uh, the landmine campaign, but I think we can also add to that the Jubilee 2000 campaign, efforts where middle-range actors, to, use a li to borrow language from John Paul Lederach's Peace Building Pyramid, the middle range actors like NGOs, civil society groups, that can have more of a play getting to parishes, engaging young people, but also engaging systems and positions of power. So I think a challenge before us is how do we beef up our collaboration and our coordination amongst ourselves going forward? And I see a lot of hope for this. Uh, so I have a question for uh, Aaron and then a question uh, for Margie here. Uh, so, uh, Aaron, uh, you, uh, you mentioned you, your, your organization, I think, is a, is a great example of young people taking action on this issue. Uh, and oftentimes, young people are seen as the future of the church or the future of the world but not quite the present. There's often this language like, you're the future. Like, but, but I think what is very frustrating as a former activist and a former leader of an international youth NGO, uh, one of the challenges is that young people are disproportionately impacted by war, right? Either as so sent off as soldiers or as victims of war, right? If you look at the number of victims who are killed in warfare, young people are disproportionately in that number. Yet the decisions that are made are not young people, the people in decision-making structures. Uh, within the UN system, there has been a move in the last 20 years to speak about the value of youth participation in decision-making, but that hasn't quite reached its way into, into this realm of disarmament. So I'm wondering if you could just talk about why, give a case as to why young people should be at the table. Great, well, thank you for that. Um, so I think, through my experience, I, I'm not sure how many of you have kids, I do not have children, but working with high school students is a humbling experience. Um, just because I think when you have the next generation, whatever generation that may be, and they challenge your own assumptions, I think it's good to kind of have a gut check on your policy. And so I think it is really true that we talk about them in terms of they're who we need to activate but also we need to recognize that they're already doing quite a bit. And I think acknowledging the agency and the power that they already have is quite important and then actually using that because we're not giving them anything that's already there and it's just trying to activate it. Um, and so I think in terms of having them at the table with girl security, we did a simulation uh, with high school and college girls on a North Korea event. And the way that they approach the issue is quite different and then the, it's interesting to see how they understand cooperation versus what the values are moving forward and I think in disarmament 
we've really struggled to continue valuing cooperation and transparency and what does that actually mean in the, in, uh, the age of evolving technology. And I think they the next generation, or Gen Z millennials, are intimately familiar with technology in ways we are not. Like, I'm a millennial and I'm bad at technology, but a lot of that, there's a, been a really interesting study, and I'm forgetting the name, but because they understand how technology works quite differently and they're quite intimately familiar with it, it's quite useful to have them at the table when you're trying to decide how to promote arms control, how to promote transparency, because they just have different ideas and different approaches. And I think for a field that's struggling to find areas of progress is something we should really consider broadening the scope of what we're looking at. Yes, several papers today talked about the need to think out of the box, right. to experiment, and I think some of that energy can come from that. Uh, just to pick up on that for a minute, you had mentioned earlier the gun, the issue of gun control mm -hmm. and how that has mobilized a lot of young people today. Uh, are, do you see connections with that and the nuclear issues? <laughs> I once had someone explain to me in a bar that nuclear disarmament and gun control were the same. <laughs> I don't think they're the same. Um, I think that there are, in terms of when you look at the threat of gun control and nuclear weapons, they are quite different, even though they are both arms. But I think in terms of the similarities, what we should be focusing on is the threat to personal security and the intolerance for that kind of threat to be so pervasive in the United States. And I think that there's just not that same level of acceptance in terms of like, oh, we have to do this for national security or like it's your right to have a gun, to, like the national security, we have to have all these nuclear weapons. I think the next generation is really questioning the very foundations of what we've assumed, and I think that will be quite useful in pulling it forward. Yeah, great, awesome. A question for Margie. Oh, do you want to speak yes. on that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, just tying in our earlier discussion about uh, nonviolence, if we take seriously um, the 2017 World Day of Peace message, nonviolence, a style of politics for peace as a way of life. I wonder if there might be more room to connect um, advocacy around gun control and advocacy around nuclear disarmament through the lens of asking, who are we becoming as a people? Uh, and to the extent that our moral horizon is, is determined uh, on the basis of fear, uh, do we need to shift our moral horizon and envision the good, the better, uh, what a world would look like without nuclear weapons, what the United States would look like without um, guns out, totally out of control, uh, right? Is there, is there a similar impulse in driving both the proliferation of nuclear weapons and the proliferation of, of arms, particularly in this country? Um, so I think there's more to explore there. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we had mentioned, uh, you had mentioned Margie, but, also, uh, but other people have mentioned the, uh, the, that Pope Francis has indicated that he wants to add nuclear weapons to the catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, he has done that already with questions on, the, on capital punishment. Uh, a lot of pushback from certain sectors of the US church on, the, on that issue, and I assume we'll, we'll also maybe see that conversation on this issue if, if we can amend our catechisms, uh, at least the online version. Uh, but so, but I, but I think there's some good news and bad news on on the question of the Catholic potential to mobilize people in the United States. So, according to the Pew uh, Religious Landscape Survey, uh, only 30% of self-identified Catholics, only 30%, say that they turn to their to the church or to their religion as a source, as the primary source for moral guidance on what is right and what is wrong. They they go to other sources, common sense and, and others. Now, we can think of natural, putting natural law aside, but if you look at evangelicals and, and uh, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, it's, the number is in the 70, 80 percent. So it's a, quite a big difference. But that's maybe a bad news or a challenge, but the good news is that's 30 percent of 70-something million people. That's still a sizable num amount percentage of the U.S. population. And we have 17,000 schools across the country, 200-something universities. So how can we better use these, these networks, these institutions, even from your experience at Notre Dame, to get this word out and to use the structures that we, ha that we already have without inventing new ones? Yeah, thanks. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what's possible. Um, 
I, I, I remember in my own formation, the Peace Pastoral was coming out the year that I started as a freshman at Notre Dame. And we had policymakers and people from, people from the Bishop's Conference and Brian Hare coming to visit on a regular basis, unpacking that document. And for many of us who were formed that way, it changed the rest of our lives in terms of what we chose to do. So if there were that kind of uh, reinvigoration of moral imagination and leadership, that would make a big difference. But I also think it can happen from the grassroots, from the ground up. Um, and, and we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, I'm part of a Catholic worker community in South Bend. And I, I think the Catholic worker movement as a whole, uh, especially in, in the United States, can be a powerful conduit for formation of conscience. Uh, I think certainly educational institutions, the, the network of Catholic schools, um, K through 12 and then higher ed, uh, is, is a tremendous resource to be tapped. I, I take the, the critical point raised earlier about uh, complicity there. I think that's a real question. If we were to address those questions of complicity more forthrightly, um, what you said a moment ago, Aaron, about uh, uh, young people challenging and to allow ourselves to say, gee, if somebody raises a question that makes me wonder about my own commitments, maybe there's something there for me to discern. Maybe that's part of my formation of conscience. I, I think our educational institutions need to do that as well. And I, I know Notre Dame would, would be among those, right, to ask those sorts of questions. If that were to happen, I think it would generate momentum because there'd be greater credibility. And credibility, I think, is something that um, our ecclesial institutions need to work on. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. Uh, yeah, and you mentioned the Catholic worker. I, I just do a quick push as a member of the Guild for Dorothy Day's canonization. Uh, I think her narrative, her witness, can be very powerful going forward. So let's all pray to get those miracles so she can be uh, uh, made a saint these days. Uh, all right, so let's let's open up this conversation because uh, there's some great great ideas that have been boiling up and 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 really converging with the papers today right now. Uh, but I would love us to think about where we can go after this conference. Uh, uh, and especially if you haven't yet spoken today, I'd, I'd, we'd love to we'd love to get some uh, get some uh, voices here. Uh, so please, uh, yes. So we'll take two questions and then then get response. Um, I really appreciate being here. My name is Stephanie Schaefer. I'm with the Center for Pastoral Counseling of Virginia. I work as a marriage and family therapist and do hands-on skill training in intercultural interfaith and interreligious dialogue and beyond us versus them, beyond prejudice. And um, I've been thinking today about the importance of the messages about building relationship and involving the youth. And I'm one, it reminds me of the importance of the successes of citizen diplomacy and how that builds goodwill and then allows the governments to then dialogue. And it reminds me of a project that was very successful in the 80s, the late 80s, it was called Peace Child. And it took mm -hmm. high school um, Soviets and US students and they worked on a play and the play was about children who went to the the leaders of their country and said they wanted to live in peace they didn't want to die and so they also spent like a, a week together they got to know each other and they would write plays about part of the play about each other's lives they sang songs in english and russian there was about 500 performances in the soviet union and the soviet kids weren't allowed to come out but then finally they did so they they did um some shows here in the United States and people in the Soviet Union cried and so did the ones in the US and they asked the Soviet leadership why did they let that group in when they didn't let other groups in and they said we like the play so I would love to see a play involving youth about showing people how we can end nuclear weapons on our planet and make the world safe for children and um, so that's one thing I'd like to see, a lot of creativity. And I'm wondering if there's what creative projects you would like to see next, My, our panelists. So. We'll get another voice in the back. Scott Buren, I'm a uh, uh, non-lethal weapons instructor for the Pennsylvania State University at State College. Mm -hmm. responsible for teaching a non-lethal weapons elective uh, at the various war college. 
unfortunately, that has been diminished significantly uh, over the last year and a half. So uh, we're not getting out there uh, like we used to for the last 15 years, and that's very unfortunate because it's not the tech, the uh, technologies from taser to millimeter wave and microwave technology. It's the mindset. It's about understanding provocation. Uh, and we, we're losing that. Um, so actually, instead of becoming more or less lethal, we're becoming more lethal. In fact, our former, uh, I'm a Marine veteran. I have the utmost respect for General Mattis, our former Secretary of Defense, and, and knew him as, as a professional colleague. But I think it was wrong about our military becoming more lethal. I think we have to understand the less, less than lethal technologies, the mindset involving non-provocative acts, negotiation, et cetera, and we're not doing well there. I came here for a, a boost of energy, and I got it, from, especially from this panel. So thank you very much. <laughs> you, you talked about the crystallization of conscience, this reawakening of conscience, which is absolutely essential. Um, I would just like to put out an invitation. This is a little bit self-serving, self-promoting, but I have to say this because you have uh, uh, motivated me to do this. We talked about what we can do. I, I'm part of a, I, a beginning of a major project in a little town called Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And actually it's not so little, it's pretty significant. Uh, if you know anything about Carlisle, you're probably familiar with Jim Thorpe, the uh, home of the in Indian Industrial School from 1879 to 1917. But it's also the home of the U.S. Army War College, a top-level school, which, which Richard Love knows well. Uh, it's also the home of the Peacekeeping Institute. It's also the home of Dickinson College, a private uh, liberal arts college, and the oldest law school in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania State University Dickinson Law School. So w what we have done in concert with the War College, Dickinson College, and the law school, we are sponsoring and promoting a War, Peace, and Justice Symposium, a five-day symposium in the spring of next year. And this is through a, a, an application to the National Endowment for the Humanities, a grant uh, titled The Dialogues on the Experience of War. Regardless of being awarded the grant, we are going to execute. We have pledged funds right now. Five-day symposium followed up by monthly discussions on topics such as nuclear disarmament, but really everything about the very nature of war, I would argue, even as military professionals, we do not understand the very nature of war, which is our profession. 19 years of conflict, we cannot solve this because we don't understand the very nature of our business. And this is sad. And so what we're trying to do is raise the consciousness of the community amongst war, peace, and justice to get at these issues. And we have been blessed and graced by the Commandant of the War College, uh, Margie Ensign, the President of Dickinson College, and Dean Daniel Conway, the Dean, who have offered their infrastructure gratis for this symposium. So this is, and, 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 and we're also working with our local parish as well. So this is a gift, and thank you. I needed the shot in the arm, because I wasn't sure if this, is, this was possible or even the right thing to do. But thank you, because it is about reawakening the moral conscience. And it's got to start with a community to let our leadership know that we want to be heard and listened to, and we were part of this little triad. Thank you. So, so creative. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's a really great question about what creative opportunities there are moving forward. And I think something to keep in mind is it shouldn't just be for like the youth. We should do this horizontally and vertically. And so I know there are efforts within the nonproliferation space now, this organization called N Square, and they've been doing really interesting work trying to get this kind of dialogue in other spaces. So connecting it with artists, with filmmakers, with people who are traditionally not involved in these conversations. And I think that will yield really creative outcomes. Uh, and also, in regards to people who are younger, I think we have to kind of think bigger about, yes, there's social media campaigns, but also promoting some sort of international dialogue and understanding. And so promoting empathy and really what security means to different people in different countries and understanding that um, your security shouldn't come at the expense of someone else's. And I think that redefining what that means is really important. And so facilitating those conversations and reconsidering what security is in light of things like nuclear weapons and climate change, but also just 
I was never asked what security was for myself. And so I think like having a more Socratic method through education is really important. And I think allowing students the freedom to explore what they think these notions are and how they should be manifested will yield the most creative outcomes that I can't fully think of right now. But I think having that dialogue in the classroom and allowing more space opposing, opposed to the top-down method of, the only thing that was mentioned to me was we built nuclear weapons, dropped them in Japan, then we had the Cold War and we won. And like that was the whole thing. Um, and so I think having a more nuanced conversation and allowing people the creative space to explore what that means is really important and that will help yield bigger change. Um, just a thought about the, the creative aspect. Um, I was in Chile during the, the plebiscite campaign against Pinochet, the last few years of Pinochet I was there. And um, leading up to the plebiscite, every night on television, the No campaign uh, had 15 minutes allotted to them on television. And um, the, the best artists and uh, Madison Avenue quality advertisers uh, shaped that campaign, and it was really powerful and inspiring, uh, so that people dared to vote no to this dictator who'd been there for 17 years, a brutal dictator, uh, and managed to overthrow him nonviolently. Uh, it, it was amazing. So when I think about what's possible, I think, you know what, I was there for that. We lived through that. That actually happened. And I, I tell my students that to stoke their moral imaginations, to say, what could it look like here? There are lots of manifestations. What, imagine if we could get artists and filmmakers on board to really put our attention, our energy into this. The energy that went into developing the Manhattan Project, what if we could harness that energy and redirect it? Uh, we can do it. Right, we can do it. The other thing I would say about um, the efforts that you're, you're doing in Pennsylvania, thank you for doing that. And uh, it's a great example of the power of community. And when we're faced with structures of sin in which we find ourselves, we suddenly realize, oh, am I complicit in this? I begin to ask that question. One of the dynamics of social sin is that I can't, if I'm in the midst of it, I'm morally blind to that. I actually need other people in the community to help me see that. And that's one reason why dialogue and communal discernment is so important. So the more fora like this and what you're doing in Pennsylvania, uh, the better. And that can happen, as we said, at many different levels, uh, all the different systems that we've been talking about today. What if it were happening in all of these different areas? Yeah. Great. So we'll take two more. Yes, and then, so starting, all right, why don't we start there since the, yeah, oh yes, okay, sorry, thanks. Hi, I'm Jeremy Faust, I'm a master's candidate at the Middlebury Institute in Monterey, and I'm currently completing a practicum at the Holy See Permanent Observer Mission in New York, um, kind of on nuclear disarmament issues. Um, and I'd like to ask the panelists to kind of elaborate on how you address polarization, because I think that's kind of like a cloud that hangs over all of this, and it's not just in the secular world, It there are you know, it's in the pews too, mm -hmm. um, and how you can kind of bridge across that gap. Um, and in a similar way, how media fragmentation, like, because even if you make an artistic piece, how can you get it out to everyone when some people are only reading Fox News and some people are only reading MSNBC? Um, kind of, what kind of strategies do you use to approach those challenges? Yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, Rose Berger from Sojourners Magazine and then also with the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Uh, one piece that's been missing maybe overtly in our conversation, but I feel it's been there um, covertly or implicitly, uh, is the, the at that as Catholics in particular, we have an access to a sacramental power mm -hmm. That we rarely engage in the service of the larger structural issues of sin out there in the world, um, and so I'm wondering. I'm, I'm thinking very specifically of the Kings Bay nuclear activists and the way that they brought a sacramental liturgical power mm -hmm. into a secular nuclear space. And while they may have spent some time in jail, I feel as if they won the day. Mm -hmm in terms of the moral, ethical, and spiritual arguments. 
And th that is just one small example of a very radically different way of engaging imagination that's a little bit different from vast social movements or, you know, that, but there, there's a lot to be um, examined in how the sacramental life that we have as Catholics can engage the principalities and powers of nuclear weapons, which is the other way that we win this, this battle. So uh, this question of how do we get to that moral imagination, that sacramental imagination, I, I'm encouraged to hear more about that. I, I mean, one thing I wondered about is, you know, People, uh, people don't get converted necessarily. Maybe, maybe in this context, with many academics, we're converted intellectually first. But most people are converted experientially first, and then they try to figure out what's happening to them. So do we need a nuclear trail of lament in the United States, where we take our students on a nuclear journey of nuclear history of the United States? What are the other ways that people become converted at the front lines of the Detroit River where the old Revere Ware uh, nuclear site just collapsed into the river <laughs> over Thanksgiving? So what do we do to bring students there to say what happened in this place? What's the deep history of this place? And then that's how you begin to open a, an imaginative conversation that has ripple effects much larger than what we can control. Well, um, the, the, the polarization question of, you know, it, you'd be amazed the bridges that get built washing dishes at our drop-in center at the Catholic Worker in South Bend. Uh, it, it, Dorothy Day uh, has, I think, the, the power of the works of mercy um, as she envisioned it is true, that no matter where people find themselves on the, the political spectrum in a very polarized society, um, beginning with the people right in front of us and saying to each other, you are loved by God and subject of dignity uh, has a tremendous bridging effect. And I think to get to what you just said, Rose, there's a sacramental quality to that. Certainly for Dorothy, but in, in our Catholic worker community, that's a very important element. Um, we have a chapel in our drop-in center, the Chapel of the Holy Spirit, and um, the, the work that happens there, I think we, we would all burn out quickly if it weren't for that grounding. And I was remembering Dorothy's, um, in 1976, Eucharistic Con uh, Congress in Philadelphia, Dorothy gave a talk uh, that Congress, that talk was on August 6th, and she was appalled that there was a mass honoring um, uh, the military uh, that day that, that said nothing about the bombing of Hiroshima. And in her talk, she brought that together as a form of lament, liturgical lament. And think about the power of our liturgy to invite people into um, ritual lament as part of a, a personal and communal examination of conscience. Um, I have never heard that invitation in any of my Catholic formation um, my whole life. And why is that? Mm -hmm. uh, Dor Dorothy has been the only person to recommend that uh, or to, to witness to that practice. Um, so. Um, I don't mean to be trite when I say this, but inviting people into practicing the works of mercy together, especially where there's polarization, invite somebody to wash dishes and see what happens. Um, it's, it's powerful. And it's, um, it's baptismal. It reminds us of our baptismal commitment to follow Jesus. Uh, just building off of that, I think the questions actually complement each other quite nicely because going to Letter X, Moral Imagination, I think the biggest takeaway from that for me was the web and the web of relationships. And I think in order to overcome polarization, you have to be open to expanding your web. And I think we've gotten to the point where people only look for what's self-affirming and they don't want to challenge themselves in a myriad of ways. But I think creating the spaces for opening where people can step into that space and create new relationships not based on their preconceived notions. And so something that I have found really effective is experiential learning. And so we'll do programs with girls on, we'll have simulations, tabletop exercises, and they're playing roles and they're kind of working through these different ideas and notions in a way that's 
a little bit removed from themselves, and so they're able to engage in it in a way that's very constructive and very open to other people. And I've found that to be really um, effective in building bridges, and even the, those who generally were unwilling to engage in that sort of dialogue really step into it. Uh, and in terms of media and making sure it's accessed, I think that is a challenge, but you also need to be aware of who you're targeting. And so what's terrifying and interesting is a lot of the next generation, if you ask where they get their news, they'll say Snapchat, which I didn't know had news, but it does, <laughs> and that's where they get it. And so I think being aware of who you're trying to access, and I think that's why it's so important to have so many different avenues of accessible nuclear information. And so there's this like street art in London of this little girl picking a flower that had a radioactive symbol on it. And that's, it was a really beautiful picture, but also deeply disturbing. Um, and I think that's a really good way to access a certain group of people versus like Madam Secretary had a nuclear scare episode. And like that also is a form of accessing people and meeting them where they are. Um, and I think all of that is incredibly valuable. It just has to be tied to this broader movement and sparking people to ask those questions of themselves, I think is really important. Um, if I may, may just say, because I think your question is very significant, that you know the Catholic Church, Catholics in the United States lean pretty almost evenly, slightly more Democratic than Republican, but in their political leanings. Uh, and but increasingly, parishes are becoming divided along the, the. We talk about the big sort, but we also see an ecclesial sort where there are you know not geographic parishes but ideological ones. Uh, in addition to the sacraments and the Eucharist, I think something that the Plowshare movement brings us to brings attention to us is this is Scripture as a source, the sim powerful symbol of Scripture, and that should be a unifying way. And I think many of us who teach in in undergraduate classes realize that many of our students, even if they've gone through Catholic education all their lives, haven't really quite engaged Scripture in a way. And they say uh, the, the, what Archbishop Tomasi, Tomasi said yesterday, you know, uh, Jesus say, "Put away your sword." What? Love your enemy? What? What does that mean? So how do we get people to read scripture? It could be a unifying space for us. All right, we'll take two more questions, and then we'll be the last ones. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Hugh Gustafson, a professor at George Washington University. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I've spent three decades writing about nuclear culture, starting with a study of nuclear weapons scientists uh, in California in the 1980s. And I found that many of the nuclear weapons scientists were very active Catholics. Uh, they went to church every Sunday. They considered themselves good Catholics, and they completely bracketed the teachings of the Catholic Church from what they did in their working life. Um, they bracketed off the Catholic bishop's pastoral letter on war and peace. The think tanks where nuclear weapons are discussed here in Washington, a number of Catholics there. If you tried to question the morality of deterrence, you would be laughed out of the room. You would have no space in the conversation. Uh, Congress is full of Catholic members of Congress who constantly vote more money for nuclear weapons. Uh, the executive branch is full of Catholics who are making plans to modernize nuclear weapons and upgrade the stockpile, right? So my question has to do with how you make conscience bite, mm. how you make people take seriously, powerful people, take seriously the moral teachings of the Catholic Church. Because at the moment, they treat it as irrelevant to the real world they live in. Um, the decisions that they make when they vote in Congress, when they work, nine to five every day on nuclear weapons are governed by realism, and Catholic theology has nothing to do with it. So how do you change that? How does the leadership of the Catholic Church make them teach, take the teachings of this uh, to church seriously? No, please, yeah, we, we can go with it. You want to go first? Okay, I, I, a couple of different strands have come together in your question, I think. One is, um, earlier today we were talking about uh, the level of the heart and feeling. I think it was uh, Alex Bird who talked about visiting Hirosh Hiroshima and being moved by um, the memory uh, of what happened there and the collective memory. And the the uh, and then the reaction of the other people with her. Uh, I think there need to be more opportunities where people can be moved at that level, not just this level, particularly for people who spend a lot of time up here, right? And that's, uh, that's an occupational hazard. How do you connect the head and the heart and the spirit uh, pastorally? And that ties in with what Drew was saying about pastoral accompaniment. Um, it, it does not work to um, 
accuse people and guilt them. But if, if we can bring people into relationship um, in smaller groups, so if there could be uh, discernment groups at the parish level um, in which people were moved to the level of the heart, you know, what, what really has happened uh, in the Navajo nation uh, with uh, nuclear contamination from, from um, testing and then also from the lack of a, a real option for waste disposal, right? Um, as one example, uh, there's the possibility of, of lament and ritual being connected there. Um, and again, people together in small groups can reach each other, can help each other see with the eyes of the heart, right? Um, not just these eyes, but the eyes of the heart. And I think that's, that's the work that really has to happen. And I, I'm convinced that it, it's going to have to happen at the grassroots level in these, in these small groups. I'm not waiting um, for further instruction from people in the hierarchy of the church, although I'm eager and tremendously thankful that Pope Francis and Archbishop Tomasi and others have spoken on this. We have a lot of work to do on the ground and here in the US, in, frankly, I think in, in, on this issue, um, the people in the pews need to start that work and hope that the bishops will follow us right, on that. And the, I completely agree with uh, your comments on that. And I think if we look at the higher levels and you asked, how do you get the decision makers to actually change their minds? I think you have to make it, you can no longer prov allow that sort of dissociation that many scientists, policymakers have of what they're doing versus what their values are because many of our scientists I talk to will say, well, that's just not my job in terms of the morality of it. And so connecting what you're doing with the actual implications I think is quite important. And I think it goes back to the grassroots work but also the web of relationships and preventing the other because the idea is that you're using deterrence to keep your people safe at the expense of other people but kind of highlighting how it's actually hurting your people, and also you can't just other populations like that. So in the Catholic tradition, it's, it's important to not just look at the sin that's in the world and the negative and the bad, but also to see grace, to see the goodness here. And I think we've seen two great experiences, whether it's the Catholic worker community in South Bend or uh, the new organizations, uh, Girl Security, where, where there's goodness, right? So how do we keep focusing on goodness and take this forward so we're not just sort of depressed and we, we go home and sleep all weekend? Uh, so thank you for this great panel. Please join me in thanking these great two speakers. Thank you.